Well, hello, everyone. Good evening. This is Mike Beam. I get to serve as your Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, this is the Specialty Crop Sector uh, session. And if you've followed our agricultural growth process and, and stakeholder involvement, uh, you know that we've, for the last eight years, had a summit, and that was held last week. And sometimes at those uh, summits, we've had various sector breakouts. Um, but this year, we, uh, we focused on a couple of overarching issues, and that was water and workforce. And we're excited about uh, putting together the feedback that we received on those two topics uh, and, and share those with all of you. But I'm also excited to uh, focus on the specialty crop sector. Uh, it's a sector that I believe uh, is growing. And there's actually been some really positive results of having these uh, specialty crop sector discussions in the past. And, and so I'm glad that, that my crew, uh, Brittany, Russ, Sammy, and others uh, have done it to, to put you all together and put together a good program. So uh, I'll stop there. Again, welcome you. Uh, it's nice to be in where it's cool. Uh, so I uh, hope that you enjoy uh, this session. Brittany? Thank you, Mike, for that welcome to everyone. Uh, I again want to reiterate, thank you everyone for attending tonight. We know it's very hot out and we appreciate your engagement this evening. So before we get started, I just want to talk about um, some virtual meeting agreements for all of us. So tonight we are here to be present. So you made time out of your busy day to be here with us. So we want you to be present. We want you to engage with our speakers. We want you to provide thoughtful feedback. Um, we're ready to listen to you as participants of the specialty crop sector. Um, speak with good intent. We just want you to remind everyone to be respectful of others' opinions throughout this meeting. Seek clarity. Um, if you have questions, please ask them. You can use the chat feature, or if the time is appropriate, you can unmute yourself and ask that question of our speakers. And then support sincerely. Collectively, we are here together tonight to move the specialty crop industry forward. Um, so let's find ways that we can work together as an industry and the stakeholders that support it. So I'm going to turn it over um, to Russell Plaschka to talk about labor challenges and workforce programs. As we start that, I'm going to launch some polls for everyone to participate in. So um, on your screen, I will let Sammy go ahead and talk about the poll questions we have for you. Thanks, Brittany. I'll just go ahead and read the first one. Um, the first one is, how many employees do you currently have? Um, zero to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, or 15 plus? So go ahead and mark your answer. Um, and then the second one on the screen is, how many employees do you desire? Zero to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, or 15 plus? So we'll give you um, just a little bit to answer those questions, and then we'll move on. Yep, and there is one, there is a third question if you scroll all the way down. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, okay the third one is how many um, unfulfilled positions do you have this year? Um, zero, one, two, three, four, or five plus. And then when you're finished, just hit submit. All right, we have about 67% of participants engaged. So um, we'll give it another couple of seconds to get your responses in, and then we'll close the poll. All righty. I'm going to share the results. So just so everyone can see, it looks like the majority of us on the call tonight have zero to four employees. Um, that's about how many we desire. Some um, are obviously larger and need more employees. And then unfilled positions. Um, the majority of you are, or 65% of you are fully staffed, which is great to hear as we lead into our labor discussion. So I'll turn it over to Russell. Thank you, Brittany. I, I, I might take a stab at, you know, since we're talking about specialty crop sector, that 
A lot of those that said they have zero unfilled positions, probably because they may be the main and only employee in that operation. So kudos to you, and especially those that have been working out there this week and this um, unbearably and unprecedented hot week. So I thank you again for also taking part in this session tonight. Workforce is probably one of the biggest issues outside of, you know, marketing and challenges and everything else. But when we talk to ag businesses and producers across the state, workforce tends to always be the number one issue. They just can't find labor, they can't find quality labor, and they can't retain labor. So, you know, and as Secretary Beam mentioned, water typically always comes up as that next issue as well. So if we look at the workforce challenges, you know, the state of Kansas, agriculture in general, if we kind of review those figures, we employ about 256,000 people across the state that work in agriculture. So that's well over 13% of the population of the state of Kansas is, is engaged in agriculture in some shape or form. So within that, you know, looking for labor in all the wrong places sometimes, or looking for labor in hopefully the right places is what we wanna do. So during the Ag Growth Summit we had last week, we talked about some of the resources that are currently out there across the state of Kansas. So tonight we're gonna to touch on, you know, four or five of those resources some of them you may be very familiar with, some of them you may have never heard of, some of them may be very applicable to you, and some of them may not even work for your operation. And we, we totally understand that, but we wanna make sure that people are aware that there are resources out there, and a lot of them are focusing on agriculture more than they used to. So that's, that's the key there, that these programs have been around for a while, but they're, they're seeing the, the necessity of engaging more with agriculture producers across the state. So next slide, please. First one we wanna look at is the Kansas Works. So a lot of you may be familiar with the Kansas Works offices or back when I was growing up, it was called the unemployment office, but today it's the Kansas Work Resources Centers across the state of Kansas. And most of our larger cities and towns across the state of Kansas has a facility in their community. And as you can see from that list, they have a whole host, they have a whole menu of op options that they can assist employers with and employees seeking employment. So whether that's the Kansas work certificates, the career readiness, whether they need help with job coaching, maybe they need help with resume writing or simply applying for a job. A simple application sometimes can be overwhelming for a lot of people, especially if they're transitioning jobs and so forth. So we wanna make sure that you understand that those Kansas work centers are available to you. And I will mention that a lot of the producers that we talk to say, well, they just don't work with agriculture. They don't help us. We have seen them engaging. We've been meeting with their teams a couple of times last year and earlier this spring, we met with the several groups of those workforce centers to talk specifically about the, the trials and, and the challenges in agriculture industry to finding quality labor. So they understand that those are out there and they're looking at how do we identify those people that walk through their doors as a possible employer for a producer, whether that's operating high tech equipment or whether that's working in a specialty crop field, those are the issues that we're working with them. Next slide, please. Next one's the work opportunity tax credit. This, this may be one of those programs that may not be available or applicable to your operation. So this, is a can allow up to $9,600 per employee hired for some federal income tax liability relief. So these are this program here is something that if you're interested in it, that would be a time to call that workforce center in your area and say, hey, I heard about this WOTC program or the work opportunity tax credit. I'd like to learn more about to see if my operation could qualify. Some of you may be straight up producers, some of you may be doing some food processing or, or after harvest processing. When once we get into those processing jobs or what commerce or the, the work centers codes classify as manufacturing, because food processing falls into that manufacturing codes, some of those jobs are eligible for this tax credit. So I encourage you if you're doing anything above and beyond the production and sales, to see if this might be an option for you. Next slide, please. The next one's the H-2A Temporary Worker Program. And this is the one where we bring in foreign workers to work for a certain amount of time in the United States. So typically a lot of people, when they think of H-2A workers, 
We have quite a few of them that work with custom harvesters across the state. We have several, uh, I know of several landscaping companies that hire H2A workers to come and work on their operation for a certain amount of time, as well as I know some specialty crop producers that are utilizing the H2A program. The issue with the H2A program, you are not necessarily guaranteed a worker. You go through an application process, you submit that application. It can be very daunting application. So a lot of people that are utilize this H2A program go through a, a, basically you might say a contractor or a service provider that takes care of the application. They submit all the paperwork for you. Of course, they charge a, a fee for that service. Again, it can get fairly expensive, but if you're having trouble finding labor, the quality of labor you get through the H2A program is pretty high. So when they get to you, they're ready to go to work right away with very little instruction, other than familiarizing themselves with your operation specifically. Uh, so the H2A program, again, it's temporary. The key thing to remember is, if you go through that application process, you're required to provide monetary support for that employee from the time they leave their home country, basically their doorstep to your doorstep. And then you must provide housing. You must provide adequate space for a kitchen, uh, food if they don't have a kitchen and so forth. So that, that, that program can be daunting, but again, uh, if you want more information about that, please contact me. We can set you up with some folks that, that provide that service. Or if you want to visit with somebody that's been through the process, we're more than happy to connect you with those folks to get a feel for what that program can do for you. Next slide, please. The Retain Work. So if this is a program that works with those employees that have been injured. So a lot of times you may have a great employee and they get injured. So what do we do if they can't come back to work? This program works with those employees to make sure they get rehabilitated, make sure that they can come back to work. They provide training and assistance. If they have a real disability, let's say that they lose an arm or a part of a leg or something like that, that they can receive training and rehabilitation through that Retain Works program to be able to train themselves back to a position to where they can come back to work for you. So you're retaining that employee. I mean, a lot of times when we talk to producers, the worst thing about losing an employee is not necessarily the physical labor, but that institutional knowledge that they've retained from working with you or for you for a certain amount of time. There's a lot of institutional knowledge that, that goes with those employees. So we wanna make sure and try to retain that. So again, just another a program that might be of service to you. Next slide, please. Also, when we think about um, not necessarily hiring employees, but do employees understand what you do or future employees? So the immersion in program is a program that we started at the Department of Ag about, oh, I'd say about five years ago now. So it's really providing students, as you can see from the picture, a hands-on experience in a day in the life. In this case, it was at a landscaping company. And so they were, in this picture, they were installing irrigation. Uh, in another part of the deal, they were operating the skid steers. They were doing some smaller heavy equipment operations with right there with supervision. They worked with the nursery and the forestry department and learned how to dig the trees, how to ball the trees, how to get them ready for shipment. So these immersion programs take about a half to a half a day or if it depends on your operation, if you want to take a full day and gives them a taste of this is what this job is really about. You know, I always talk about we drive by farms, we drive by specialty crop producers, or in this case, nurseries, or in Western Kansas, the feed yard industry, you drive by it and you think, yeah, I know what those jobs are. Well, students that are going through high school today really have no idea of the, the depth and the breadth of jobs that are available, maybe behind the scenes. If you're a larger operation, chances are you may have a bookkeeper, you have an accountant. If you're a very larger operation, you may have somebody that's in charge of HR and onboarding and, and taking care of your insurance needs and everything like that. And even to the point of looking at the production, those people out in the fields, students need to understand what that work is about, the benefits of it, the passion that you put into your production and your farm, and, and get them a real sense of what that is about. So that's a program that we work with you on, and we'll walk you through that and be there every step of the way that first time and, and basically gives you a blueprint to conduct that every year, every other year, and you're working with your local schools. So trying to keep that local talent 
close to home. Next slide, please. And the last program is the Registered Apprenticeship Program. So the Kansas Registered Apprenticeship Program, this program has been around, and I guess I should say it's been on the books for years, but just recently through the Department of Commerce, they kind of reinvigorated it and, and pumped a little more money as well as some more uh, employees into that program to get it ramped back up. So this is really an industry driven, it's driven by you. You request to have a, a, an apprentice brought onto your place. And it's similar to if they were still in high school, a part of a career in tech ed program to where they're learning at school, but they're also learning hands-on with you. And there is a true program built just for you. So it is an individualized learning and on the job training program for you and that person that you'd like to eventually hire. And that's the goal. They're gonna apprenticeship with you for whatever time period to get them through the certifications or to where you're pleased with their, their educational and, and on the job training progress, and then they can become your full-time employee. So that registered apprenticeship program is run through the Department of Commerce. Again, that's another program that when you connect with your Kansas Workforce Center, that that's another program that they can help you get in touch with. Or again, if you wanna contact us or myself, be more than happy to connect you with the folks there at the Department of Commerce on that registered apprenticeship. I might also add that Kansas Farm Bureau is a, uh, not necessarily a contractor, but they are working with the registered apprenticeship program as well. So the Kansas Farm Bureau, of course, is focused on our farm families across the state of Kansas. So that's also something maybe you can contact your local Farm Bureau office and find out more about their, their program that might be even more tailored to your specific needs. So that's kind of a rundown of the programs that we have available across the state of Kansas, as well as some of the programs that we offer at the Department of Ag, like I mentioned, the uh, Immersion Experience Program. So I'll be watching the chat for any questions for a while and I'll, I'll answer them online as well. And I'll turn it back to you, Brittany. Thank you, Russell, for sharing about those workforce programs available to our specialty crop producers. So like Russ said, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, but at this point, we're going to move forward with our grower panel. So I'm going to turn it over to the Kansas Specialty Crop Growers Association who helped organize this panel um, to lead the discussion. And I'm gonna stop sharing my PowerPoint so we can see all of our speakers better. Okay. Uh, thank you all. It's uh, great uh, to see, oh, I'm pushing 80 people here. That's really good to see. My name is Peter Pearson. I am the project manager for Kansas Specialty Crop Growers Association. We are a, uh, those of you that are not familiar with us, we are a 501c5 independent grower driven uh, networking and advocacy uh, organization. Uh, we have been tasked with putting together a panel on scaling up production. And when we first discussed the format and framework for this, it, it seems like we, this topic comes up on panels discussions frequently, and it's always the big growers. I've got a, an assortment uh, tying in uh, with that last uh, uh, that last poll question. Uh, yeah, what some 70% had, you know, zero to four. And as Russell said, most of our growers, especially crop growers are much smaller. As a matter of fact, uh, some 35% 35, 35 of our especially crop growers that, uh, in the state are under two acres. Another 30% are under five acres. So I've got a good representation of, uh, again, the, the large, some of the larger growers that have, have thought big from the beginning and made it big, and a group of smaller growers from Southwest and Southeast Kansas that are both working independently and also collectively. Uh, if we would, uh, I see on the uh, panel, that we, you wanted to launch a poll question before we got started, correct? Yes, let me um, get that launched here. Okay, number one, what marketing channels do you currently utilize? Community support, agriculture, farmers markets, food hubs, schools, restaurants, retailers, distributions, institutions, or other. You can type in the chat, please. and then submit your answer.
in the chat, grocery. Thanks, Scott. Donation to food pantries. We own and operate a small farm store. Online sales, online, another online sales. Thanks, Lori and Aaron. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Brittany. <laughs> I was going to say, I just closed the poll so you can see the results. 66% um, of our participants tonight are using farmers markets as a marketing outlet, but we do have uh, a pretty fair mix of the other marketing channels. All right. Uh, I've been going through the participants. Looks like all the ones that I am expecting are here. Um, and those of you that uh, on the panel that we put together, uh, I got you all a copy of the questions that we'll be framing this discussion on. And if you would start very briefly, just that question number one, just introduce yourself. Uh, tell us who you are, your 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 farm name, your, your operations today, uh, your current business model. How what are you growing? How are you selling? Go ahead. Let's start with. Uh, why don't we start with Jacob Thomas? Okay. Good evening, everybody. So my name is Jacob Thomas. And my wife and I own Jet Produce and Meats in Leavenworth, Kansas. We um, we raise just about every type of specialty crop, every kind of vegetable that is in the catalog as we follow the seasons. We've got five high tunnels, two greenhouses, and now 18 acres of field production. And our primary business model is farmer's markets. We go to three farmer's markets on Saturday mornings and have an on-farm store that's open seven days a week. Peter's still muted. I say we go to Scott Thelman. Yeah, next. Scott, you're next. Sorry about that. All right, cool. Hopefully you guys can hear me. I'm in an office uh, in downtown Lawrence right now, unexpectedly. So good to see everybody this evening. Um, my name is Scott Thelman, and I'm the owner of Juniper Hill Farms in Lo Lawrence, Kansas. Um, Jacob and I actually ended up uh, becoming cyclones together uh, up at Iowa State and graduated the same year. And so really, I think both of us got our starts um, kind of trying to grow our operations full time um, about the same time. And at that point, we were growing about two acres of produce, but but prior to that had just been growing out of a 20 by 96 foot high tunnel. And so um, started roughly uh, 10, 11 years ago at this point. And today we're at about 50 acres of specialty crops, um, primarily pumpkins and winter squash. But we also have extensive tomato and, and pepper um, production enterprises. And so altogether, we have about 64,000 square foot underneath plastic. Primarily, that's in high tunnels, um, a hay grove high tunnel system, but then also a substantial greenhouse area as well. Um, on top of that, we do some row crops that we distribute for about a dozen growers across Kansas and, and Missouri as well. All right. Uh, Scotty and Jacob are both also on our board as president and vice president. Thanks for your service. Uh, let's go to Steve out in Garden City. Steve Michael. Yes, Steve Michael. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm doing this by my phone today unexpectedly. I um, hope you can hear me all right. I'm from Garden City. Uh, we have a store, which we have three businesses at this location. And that's where we started our especially crops business about four years ago. We have uh, about 9,000 square foot under tunnel, and then uh, uh, several smaller tunnels uh, that we do grow in, plus some field area. We have a total of seven acres for our store and, and every place that we grow. Um, we've grown the business mainly by, we have a store, a showroom with a store and glass door coolers, and we have our own produce market at the store. We do not go to the farmer's market, being as we have three different businesses at one location. It's just the wife and I, and we really can't leave. Um, so we have grown substantially this year. Um, we finally made giant production for our tomatoes, 
and uh, those have just been overwhelming uh, how well they grew this year. Um, <clears throat> we do a good business in our store up to this year. We had trouble trying to keep all the coolers full. This year we have everything full. And in past years, we've sold everything we could grow. So we've been trying to double production every year. Um, we have done that to a certain extent. Um, without the use of many employees, we only have one part-time uh, employee who has been extremely helpful. Um, we grow tomatoes, peppers, all of the coal crops, sweet corn, um, watermelons, pumpkins, and um, cantaloupe right now. A lot of odds and ends uh, vegetables that um, people don't normally carry. Our big one that has really been a hit this year is okra. And we're gonna try to double production on it this next year as um, we do post all of our um, things that are available on Facebook. We have our own Facebook page. Uh, it is under Prairie Wind Produce. And um, you get updates there on what's in the coolers now, what's new, what's almost ready. And we have a great following right now in the, the only other real grower that we have in our area was in Ulysses and he got hailed out. So he's kind of struggling with what he has available. Um, to my knowledge right now of any quantity, we're the only ones anywhere in the Southwest that has quantities of red tomatoes. So um, that's kind of a bonus for us. We've drawn people in from 90 miles away in all directions. Okay, um, thanks, Steve. Uh, let's move on and cover some of those other things that you're getting into in the next set. Uh, also from Southwest Kansas, uh, Steve is also on our board and another board member from Southwest Kansas, uh, Holly Lebrun, I believe I saw she's here. Uh, she's been one of the growers we've been working with in the Kearney County Lakin area. Uh, go ahead, Holly, introduce yourself. And Hi, everybody. I'm Holly. I'm I'm from between the Lakin and Ulysses area in far southwest Kansas. Um, we've, as uh, Steve's been a mentor to me with his, what he's doing. I currently have um, farm about an acre. Um, it, I, I moved up to a, a, an acre this year. Um, a lot of challenges with, um, we finally got some rain. So we had some challenges with that and, and all kinds of different things. My current market is, my best market is subscriptions, which I've been working, I've, I started three years ago, um, been working mainly started with flowers and herbs and have moved on to vegetables. Um, the, the COVID kind of moved everybody into wanting more homegrown produce. And it seems like the flowers are a luxury. The produce is what people are looking for. So um, we've done very well on our subscription business to the point we are sold out on our um, vegetable subscriptions, close to sold out on the flower subscriptions. Um, and looking to up our production in the vegetable area um, to at least double next year. Um, we have people on a waiting list and uh, wish I was where Steve was at with his tomatoes, but we're not yet. So <laughs> different challenges with different crops this year. So um, I would say that our, our main avenue is the subscriptions in the farmer's market, which I am also on the board for the Kearney County Farmer's Market. And we have done some extraordinary things in the last couple of years. Uh, Peter will probably touch on that in a little bit and we'll go into that on the next question. But um, we are struggling to keep up with production and labor, of course. Um, it's just me. My husband helps me with all the mechanical stuff, but pretty much I do all the harvesting and marketing and all of that. So um, that's where we're at. All right. Yeah. And Holly, we'll get back. Uh, Holly is part of a pretty remarkable group of growers that uh, 
went from just a handful of people in a, in a driveway to what are you at 18 right now? And we'll talk about you, yeah. what, what worked for you guys in that. You're a good model for some of the others. Uh, we've got a couple from Southeast Kansas, uh, Chad Shiflett. If you're here, if you just wanna briefly introduce yourself and tell us about what you're doing right now. Yeah, um, hi everyone. My name is Chad Shiflett. I am the owner of SEK Mushrooms in Independence, Kansas. Uh, for the last 13 years, I have been studying market gardening and mushroom cultivation. Um, I've also partnered out here with quite a few growers to be able to build a sustainable, healthy food network. Um, so our primary sales are at the farmer's market, grocery stores, and directly to consumer by delivering to their doorstep. Um, there's many customers or many um, growers out here that I've been able to connect with to be able to source specialty crops, meats, uh, vegetables, fruits, um, among other things. Um, it's been pretty incredible out here. Um, we're working on building a big food hub, um, but one of the growers we have out here who is also with us tonight is Erin Bunn. She's been doing a pretty pretty incredible thing as well. She has the CSA program up and going. Um, she's been working on um, subscription boxes weekly with, I think, around $25 worth of produce. It's been pretty amazing out here. Um, so I actually have some mushrooms here with me. So these are blue <laughs> oysters. <laughs> Um, I develop uh, blue oysters, uh, lion's mane, tataki, um, and many other mushrooms as well. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, Chad's done a pretty remarkable job. And again, he's part of a, um, a an evolving network down in Independence. Aaron, if you're here, if you just want to briefly introduce yourself, Aaron. You're muted. Okay, a good wave there. Um, okay, hi, I'm Erin Bunn. I'm um, the owner of Bunn's Backyard Farm here in Independence also uh, that Chad was talking about. Okay, good to see y'all here. Um, there's some reasoning behind this. Uh, the, the last three, Chad, and, well, Chad, Aaron, Steve, and then Holly, uh, varying stages of trying to develop uh, a, a collective scale. As I said, 35% uh, of our growers are two acres or less, but put them together collectively, uh, it can make a remarkable impact. Holly, if you just want to talk briefly about how, what was the catalyst and how you guys got together and got so big, uh, so fast? <laughs> okay, so we struggled with our farmer's market about three years ago. We had very few vendors to the point where we actually shut down our market early because there were not enough vendors and not enough people and not enough produce growers still aren't. But um, so we decided to revamp that and see what we could do to help the community and ourselves and get the word out there. So um, we started uh, doing a little bit more, making our farmer's market, a uh, farmer's market. Um, we were able to, with help of um, Kansas Specialty Farm Growers Association this year, we were able to get some chalkboards for everybody. And through another grant, we were able to get canopies for everybody. So we look more professional. And I think that's really important um, for everybody to do to make your market successful. Um, we were able to reel in a lot of the community and make some community events out of our farmers markets, meaning um, making it a community event, um, having different um, things for people to look at. So we did, <laughs> we have a dairy lady. And so she brought in a dairy cow and we had the dairy cow so people could see that. The bee lady brought in her beehive so people could see that. And it got the community involved in like in July, we had a deal where they had water games and stuff for the kids. And um, so our farmer's market was weekly back when we weren't getting people and we've moved it into being once a month, which was concerning for me, but it has worked out incredibly well. We went from like two vendors and some of the people were having, were not farmer's market. They were more crafty people. And so we kind of aced that out and got in touch with a lot of the community. And we now have 18 to 20 vendors that are there, all kinds of stuff. I mean, we've got produce people, meat people, dairy people, chicken people, egg people, and it's really come a long way. And it's pretty incredible, the community response that we've had. So 
It's been a really great experience in getting everybody together. We created a uh, farmer's market crate. So um, during, during we do it every quarter. I'm sorry, we do it every quarter. So right now we're doing the summer crates. And so we have people signed up and we're at a loss right now because we cannot produce enough to get enough um, customers. We would like to be at 100, 200 boxes. We're at like 25. Um, but that's all that our local growers can commit to because we need more production and um, some access to some help. Um, so that's where we're at, but we've come a long way and um, there it's, it's going well. Good. Uh, Chad and Aaron and Steve, uh, ring a bell. Um, community involvement. Uh, in Holly, is it safe to say you and I have talked in the past, uh, it's kind of a, excuse the analogy, but a chicken and the egg. The more suppliers you have, the more diverse products you have at your farmer's market, your demand goes up, correct? Very much so. And we've been and able to put together, um, we're collaborating. So we have some of our growers are engaged, like I, myself and two other growers are and producers are engaged. So I'm now selling meat products, dairy products, and my vegetables and my flowers. And I have two other vendors that are, so we're handling different markets. I do Ulysses. I have another lady that does Syracuse, Lakin, I mean, Syracuse, Garden City, and then the monthly thing we all do Lakin. And also Leota is included in that. So we're trying to get together a bigger hub so that we have more people involved. Yeah, uh, Chad and Aaron, uh, you want to talk briefly about what you're trying to do? I think it ties in very well. Uh, I met with you guys a couple of weeks ago in Independence, and we had three members uh, from community organizations here that were invested in you as well. You guys want to talk about your vision in that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are trying to develop a central food hub to collectively bring all of the growers together. Um, I think a building with a processing kitchen is going to give the structure that the growers need to be able to get into grocery stores. Uh, one of my goals is to be able to help people um, write SOPs, uh, standard operating procedures, food safety plans, um, and just overall safety of consumable items for, for the consumer. Steve, uh, any thoughts? Some of the obstacles you've been facing in Garden City? We may have lost Steve. I know he was on a cell phone. Um, Scott, I'm going to put you on the thought. Uh, as a very large grower, uh, what do you see as the oppor opportunities to collaborate or work with some of these smaller growers? Uh, is there any possibility of someone as big as you becoming something of uh, a, a regional input source for food. How, how do you see you fitting in with uh, uh, these smaller growers? Any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, it wasn't too long ago. Um, I was a very small grower myself and, and utilizing a lot of my neighbors for purchasing supplies, um, purchasing seeds and and borrowing equipment. Um, still do. Um, thanks, Garingers, <laughs> if you're on the on it tonight. But um, it's a uh, it's a community um, that whether large or small, we're all in it together. And so the biggest goal I have, um, you know, I'm on, on the side of the state where there's a lot more growers. And so, you know, one could say more competition, but I see it as so much more opportunity to feed and grow a food system. And I think that that can be translated across the state, but you know, what, can I do or, or what is our place as a, as a larger scale grower that's currently distributing for other growers across the state? It's helping create market access for them over time. Now we can only build so many markets on our end and we can only build so many markets without gap certification um, from growers. Um, and that's a huge challenge that I think many growers think is very burdensome. But um, I remind everybody on the call today that K-State um, and, and Research and Extension has a wonderful food safety program. And without them and the GAP cost share program available, um, we wouldn't have gotten our GAP certification four years ago, which has opened up markets for us, such as Whole Foods, Liberty Fruit, CNC Produce, um, and a, 
Sporting KC, a wide variety uh, of customers that ordinarily would only be working with a Cisco, U.S. Foods, Benny Keith, you name it, because of the food safety requirements um, of many of these large companies. And so definitely taking advantage of the resources available through K-State Research and Extension, and then reaching out to folks like me, particularly in the off season, we're really busy now. But to learn more about what it takes to have a uniform package, you know, what our customers are looking for and to meet USDA grade is something I'm happy to talk to anybody about if they're looking to scale up. Great. Very aware of the time here. Uh, the smaller growers here represented Chad, Aaron, Steve, Holly, uh, 10 seconds or less. What do you need? Well, I guess on our side, um, we've gained knowledge and, and have people know where we're at right now. Um, scaling up is really hard. You need more equipment, you need more people, and you need more time. Um, I had written myself a grant to get technology back in so that I would have more time to do that. Um, I haven't got that yet, but uh, we're working on it. All right. Holly, what do you guys need? My biggest thing is help, labor, um, upfront labor. If I could get everything together in the beginning of the season, I wouldn't be in such bad shape. But I, I'm a single person, and I'm doing an acre pretty much organic. You know, I don't use chemicals. Um, it's been a hard year. It's been really hard. And there is so much opportunity out there. There is so much to do. But... Um, I need help. I need cold storage and I need a processing facility. Um, my husband is quite sick of having me have a <laughs> Holly's flower shop and a Holly's vegetable processing in my house. <laughs> okay, Chad so, and Aaron, quickly, what do you need? Uh, sorry, go ahead. That's a, I need the same things as Holly. <laughs> okay. I'm also a one woman show. I need help and I need storage and I need, uh, yeah, basically the same thing. I need my house back. <laughs> Chad, any comments to wrap up? Yeah, I'm in the same boat too. I, I could use help as well. Um, one of the biggest things I think in our area is the development of our building, the central food hub. Um, that'll again, allow access for people. I need to be able to teach people how to do SOPs. Um, one of the big questions I get from small growers around here is how do I get into grocery stores? How do I write this paperwork to be able to get approved, to be able to be in grocery stores? Uh, how do I scale up? So this will give us a central kind of building to be able to teach people and distribute food as well. All right, thanks. Let's wrap it up. Uh, Brittany, I see another uh, survey question, poll question. If you want to do that right now, then we'll jump into my Please. brief presentation. All right. What barriers are in the way of scaling up your production? Labor needs, training, lack of in infrastructure, um, identifying marketing channels, understanding food safety regulations, or please type other in the chat. We'll give you um, a few seconds here to answer that and then submit your question or your answer. And Sammy, while everybody's answering that question, I figured before I muted myself, I might just chime in and echo what what Chad and, and Holly and really everybody said is um, it's infrastructure that is the biggest need, I think, across the state for growers, um, big or small, the ability to preserve our produce, whether it be for a seven day shelf life of lettuce or, or multiple months um, for winter squash. That is one challenge that I think faces every grower across the state. So or the idea of service. food hub or food centers um, I think uh, is something to be thought more of um, uh, as we get more folks thinking about scaling up and taking that next step. Thanks, Scott. Okay, yep, looks like you're right. That one's the winner. <laughs> and then coming in second is labor needs. So thank you. All right, I'm still up. Uh, real quick, Steve Michael. Oh, there you go. Your mic was hot. Uh, you're good now. Uh, I'm going to give an organizational update. And this, what we just talked about really ties in really well with something I 
myself and Baird Strawn is here with us. He's uh, with Watergrass. I'll give him a chance to introduce himself in a moment. Uh, they're our database and directory development platform people. Uh, just a brief summary. Again, I am the sole paid agent, a staff person under contract with Kansas Specialty Crops at, uh, at, at most halftime. And that said, uh, all of you on that are on the board, yes, we're going to have a board meeting soon. All of you on that had it's expressed interest in joining the board a few months ago, we're going to follow up on that. You're still needed. Just wait for an email from me. We have been more than busy this year uh, uh, working with a lot of these smaller growers that you just saw with a bill, you know, as Holly mentioned, just getting some things to create visibility, create some networking opportunities in each of the areas, reaching out to community under a specialty crop block grant that we'll be wrapping up this fall. But we have been working uh, ever since I came on, it's been three years ago now, uh, creating a database uh, we inherited from the remnant organizations that we were, uh, that became Kansas Specialty Crop Growers, and also extensive uh, data collection on our part since I've been gone. We have a remarkable database, and we evolved well past the spreadsheet uh, format uh, quite some time ago. And we contracted out after doing some research and, and uh, looking into, contracted out with Watergrass. Um, that said, Baird, if you just want to introduce yourself and let them know briefly a little bit about what Watergrass is as an organization and as a platform. Muted. Sorry. There you go. started so beautifully. All right. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me and and thanks to all of you for, for the work you do, producing the food that I get to eat. I really appreciate it. Um, and I know that it is incredibly hard work. And I'm hoping that the database that we're helping you develop will make your lives easier and connect you with other growers who um, you can share information with or maybe even build a, an infrastructure hub with. Um, we work with a lot of nonprofits and help them share information amongst themselves. All right. That said, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, we started out, uh, I'll share my screen here in a moment. We started out building a database that we can use internally. We have an active Facebook group, a private group of over 250 accounts per month engaged. And it's nothing but uh, letting people know what's going on. Uh, I saw a post this morning, hey, who's got fruit? I saw a post the other day, who's got tomatoes? There's a tremendous amount of informal networking going on. And from our database, we've got over 350 uh, growers and markets in our database right now with, I believe, uh, 180 to 200 right now have uh, fields uh, entered on what they're growing and things like that. I'm going to share my screen and show you what we have been waiting for for a long time. This is, uh, we have evolved now from my being able to go in and find out who's growing what, where, and when your membership is expired and get messages out. This uh, Baird and his Watergrass team have been working to compile our, uh, our extensive and complicated uh, data fields. Now we are equipped for you, the growers and grower members to go in and find out who's growing peaches in which counties. You can do multiple searches across here. If you uh, were looking for peaches, I saw this the other day on our Facebook page, someone's looking for melons, but if a market or one of you wholesalers are looking for more of something, uh, uh, tomatoes got hailed out somewhere. Uh, and you can you can do a search. And if you look at the fields we've got right now, uh, we also have how you market, how you sell, how you market, again, how you're getting the word out, how you sell. If you were looking for a wholesaler, you can do searches as to who's doing wholesaler. Contact information right now is defaulted to our generic email. But over the course of the next few weeks, next few months, uh, we're going to do a rollout, a trial period where it's going to be available for the public to access and utilize. And over that time, I'm going to be doing a lot of outreach and orientation, get people up to speed on this. 
um, and also have people give them an opportunity to update their, their data, including uh, giving permission or not to put in their contact people uh, information there. People can just reach out directly to each other. Um, each grower that in market that is um, a paid member will be able to go in and and update their uh, their data in real time. Uh, so I don't have to do it anymore from our membership forms. But again, this is what we've been working on. Uh, all the small and medium sized growers across the state um, have really expressed a desire to have this. Uh, you know, I, I could go on and on about the different opportunities, but just to connect people with what's going on right down the road, uh, what's going if they have a if, if 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 they have a farm farmers market stand that they're looking to diversify their um, their product inventory, they can reach out to people through this. We're going to try to formalize the informal networking that's taking place right now. Over time and resources, we're we've been doing the best we can with the resources that we've got. Uh, but over time, we're going to add some more fields. How are you growing? High tunnels, organic, uh, cover crops, I mean, those kinds of things, and other things of interest. Uh, but right now, this is it, folks. I know a lot of you have been talking about this for a year now, and thank you, Baird and his team. It is operational. There's a lot of little tweaks we got to work out in the next few weeks and months as we move ahead, but this is it. All well, right. I was um, I was just going to say this is meant to be really easy to use. So um, when you look at it at first, what you'll see is the full list, and you can just browse through it, decide what you want to look at it. Uh, what you want to look at. But then if you decide, no, no, I need information fast, get me kale and get it to me in Harvey County. So you put... Nope, nobody with... Okay, nobody oh, with... Johnson kale. County. All right, let's go there. There you go. Okay. Oh, my backyard. Um, and just be aware, this is not a complete list of our database. This is just a sample right now. Uh, let's do something better. Let's, let's do peaches in... Okay, Geringer's, Overland Park, Tubby Fruits. And again, this is just a partial list for right now. Uh, who's growing greens in Douglas County? Who's selling greens? Who's growing greens in Douglas County and selling in a restaurant or selling wholesale? Uh, the, the search this is the base uh, to start out with, but the search capacity is exactly what we set out to do. It's it's pretty remarkable. And we're going to expand the fields, again, over time and resources, including financial resources and time and attention. But uh, for now, this is it. I am genuinely excited to have this out in front of you, finally. And we're going to get it out to the, uh, at least in our... Uh, We'll get the link out and sometime in the coming weeks, probably, to have it open for the public, and we will uh, actively recruit uh, membership renewals and new members to to keep access and build this database as we go. Okay. Um, just one thing: Would you show the uh, the survey itself, Peter? There it is. Um, so th this is the survey. I'm sure it'll change a little bit. But one of the most important things will be keeping current data from you folks as you try a new crop or a new growing method. And we're going to set this up so that if we're so that we'll ping you each year and ask, would you please update your survey? And if you go to your survey, you'll find that we've checked off everything from last year. So you find your, it'll be pre-populated with all your last year's information, and you just need to change what's new. So that should make it easier. And I'm hoping that that with um, with with Peter's encouragement, you guys will really keep uh, you'll grow this and that you'll keep it up to date so that uh, the information and it's really useful. That's all. I had one last quick closing. Uh, our board treasurer, Dr. Kerry Rivard, made a comment when I gave him a quick preview yesterday, and I, I agree. We may actually need to change the name of this survey is the default uh, uh, data uh, section in Watergrass Salesforce, but uh, our growers are probably tired of surveys. We may change this to 
grower profile or something like that. But we'll uh, we'll, we'll be open to the input. I see uh, some things popping up in chat. But again, over the next weeks and months, we're going to have a lot of opportunities to get out and and show this off and get input and revise it uh, for a good working model for all the growers. Thank you. Thanks, Baird. Yep, my pleasure. Peter, there was one question in the chat that asked, do you have to be a member or will the information be publicly? As I said, we are going to have this open for the public uh, for a trial period. But we, as an organization, we are 501c5, uh, relying on membership contributions and grants. We are going to, our board will discuss this, but uh, it's our intent. And please, if our board wants to pipe in, but it's our intent. We have an active uh, membership. We have a... Uh, over the last few years of over 170. Um, and if, if we could just get the, the people on our Facebook page, it'll be open to members only over time. Uh, and um, markets uh, markets can be members, uh, distributors can be members. Uh, we are going to be very clear that this will not be used for solicitation of any sort, networking, and yes, reaching out to get some products, but um, no marketing or solicitation. That's one of the things that kept us away from some of the other platforms. Uh, but again, initially open to the public to give it a trial run over time, but we will be uh, keeping this to members only over time unless we reach some arrangement for funding in another arena. Scott, do you want to pipe in on that? Yeah, sure. I think at the end of the day, it's uh, all of our members' choice on whether or not their information is public, um, but I do think that there's opportunities for um, us as an organization to be able to leverage our our contacts with all of our our members and the data that we have to be able to generate some revenue for the organization while also helping our growers access new markets. And so I, you know, think within our membership, there's definitely opportunity for allowing one another to to access and 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 connect and network with one another across the state. But you know, as we start looking for um, you know, how can we turn this into something that really is a market creator um, for our memberships? That might be, um, you know, connecting a grocery store that's looking for a local supplier that may not have the time to go out and find one with this list. And and I think a bigger question that that myself, the board, and, and KSCJ as a whole has to answer is, is that something that we need to figure out how to charge for to, to make KSCGA a sustainable and long-lasting organization for, for the future? Thanks, Scott. Okay, I see a lot of things in the chat. I will try to address them uh, as we move ahead. I will stop my screen sharing and turn it back over to Brittany and Sammy. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that update. I'm gonna start sharing my screen again. And I am going to turn it over to Rebecca McMahon with Kansas State University um, to talk about the next section of our agenda. Thanks, Brittany. Um, can you let me share my screen? Yes, give me one moment. Sorry, I'm on mute. I think I just stopped my sharing, so you should be able to. Yep, you look good. Okay. So um, I'm glad to be here to talk to all of you tonight. I know I know many of you already, or we've run across each other in a number of different ways. Um, I'm Rebecca McMahon, and I'm the Local Food System Program Administrator for K-State Research and Extension. And if you've never heard that title associated with K-State Research and Extension before, um, that's because it is a brand new position as of mid-April as part of a regional food system partnership grant. Um, and this project grew out of um, our uh, KSRE local food transdisciplinary team that was formed just before the pandemic started in 2020 and has slowly kind of been gaining momentum and, and taking on new and hopefully bigger and better projects as we go. Uh, so my goal tonight is to give you a very quick overview of some of the things that we're doing as part of our grant 
and hopefully inspire you to connect with us um, in one of several different ways to, um, you know, get access to more resources or help us help you make progress on the challenges in your communities. Um, so the first thing that I really want to showcase for you is our new website, our new Kansas Local Foods website. Um, and the link, as you can see, is kansaslocalfoods.org. And our goal with this website was really to make it kind of a clearinghouse for everything related to local food systems. So if you're like, how do I start a farmer's market? Hopefully you can find resources that will connect you with more resources, you know, and information from KDA and things like that. If you're looking for um, information on how to get involved with farm to school, <laughs> um, there's information on that and uh, we're connecting back to KSD and so on and so forth. So take a look at the website. Um, it's only as good as the feedback we get. So if we're missing linking to a group that you work with or um, something happening in your community, let me know. We'll get um, that linked up as best as we can. So um, take a look, you know, see if we're missing things, if we've got gaps, things don't make sense. Um, we'd love to hear um, about that. So a really quick, very quick overview of our grant objectives without getting into all the, the grant language. Um, <clears throat> but the big picture with our grant is to increase local food system education, coordination capacity, and resources across the state. Um, so just trying to pull all the pieces together, you know, all the cool things that all of you are doing in your local communities. And, um, you know, the uh, panel was talking about infrastructure. Um, a lot of what we're doing is about human infrastructure, you know, and making those connections and um, helping folks build out um, what they need for their communities. Um, so we're working with just access to resources, um, technical expertise, and our real goal is to serve as much of the state as we can, you know, not just little pockets here and there. Um, so that's one of the things that we'll be working towards is doing a better job of serving the entire state related to local food system topics. Um, so our program staff are myself um, and Amanda Lindahl. Um, so I have actually been with K-State for 15 years. I was the horticulture agent in Sedgwick County for the last 15 years and then uh, joined in this role in April. Um, and Amanda, I will actually let her introduce herself really quickly um, in a couple more slides when we get to the fellows program. Some of you already know Amanda as well from her work in the uh, Kansas City metro area. So do feel free to reach out to one or both of us um, if you have questions about what we're doing. Um, I do encourage you on our website uh, to check out the Get Involved page, sign up for a mailing list. That's the best way to stay up to date with what we've got going on um, and, you know, see what all is on there as well. Um, so a few quick um, things that we are already uh, in the middle of doing. We have our uh, quarterly local food virtual town halls. I know many of you have joined those town halls in the past already. Um, they're typically the fourth Wednesday um, of January, April, July, and October. We have lightning presentations by guest presenters about a hot topic. And then we have a chance to kind of talk and share and learn about what's going on across the state. Efforts, grant, grant applications, new projects, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, our next town hall is actually Wednesday, October 18th at 11 a.m. And our tentative theme is kind of focused on food security related topics. And knowing that um, all of us get busy all the time, uh, if you aren't able to join live, we do have the notes and recordings on our website as well um, from that, from those town, hall, town halls. You can register for the next town hall by scanning the QR code or um, visiting the link on the screen. Um, the next thing that we've got coming up as part of our grant are doing a series of local food community roundtables. Um, I keep adding more locations. <laughs> I thought it was going to be 10 and then it was 11. Now I think it's 12, maybe 13. I don't know for sure. Um, 
so one of our goals is to just do take the opportunity to visit all different parts of the state and get a better idea of what are the gaps. So kind of like we've done tonight a little bit, thinking about scaling up, what are the challenges, but in a broader sense, what are the gaps, what are the needs, um, what are the needs for resources, for technical assistance, things like that um, in different communities in different parts of the state. So basically, if you're involved with food in some capacity, then we would invite you to attend one of the roundtables. Um, we're still working really hard to get all the final details sorted out. I do have dates on the website for most of the locations. Um, Southwest Kansas, I'm still uh, sorting out uh, exact times and a couple other locations as well. Um, I will say we'll also have virtual location or opportunities. Um, we're going to do virtual sessions on Tuesday and Thursday, December 5th and 7th, uh, one session at noon and one session at 7 p.m. on both of those days. So if you can't make an in-person one, you will have a virtual option as well. Um, so I will uh, turn it over to Amanda really quick to talk about our fellows program, which I think is one of the things that most folks are really excited about with this grant. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. So um, the Local Food Fellows Program is the component that I am managing in my role as our Local Food Systems Program Coordinator. So I'm happy to um, share more about this opportunity, opportunity that we have for our partners across the state to access um, the opportunity to hire somebody that we will pay, we will compensate in order to connect you and build, help build your capacity for local food systems projects. So you can apply now to host a fellow and we're talking about fellow periods that will be next year in 2024. So it takes a long time to process through hiring um, people and getting positions posted and whatnot. So um, you can apply now to host a fellow in either the spring or the summer of next year. And the opportunity is really open to a wide variety of what you might choose to, um, to pursue in this fellow opportunity. But we do require when you apply to host that you have an idea of a specific project that you want this fellow to work on. So um, we really anticipate that this will help kind of jumpstart some new project or um, help, you know, facilitate whatever that is to increase the capacity of your local food system. So whether that's involved in marketing, um, you know, production, it could be anything along the lines of like processing or distribution that helps support your um, increased capacity. So we are compensating $17 an hour for 320 hours for a fellow. And we have kind of two different funding pools, one being a K-State student um, fellow that will be for next summer. Um, and so we'll take care of kind of all of that payroll um, for a K-State student fellow. And then alternately, we have money to give directly to our partners to hire their own independent fellows. Um, and so we anticipate those would be more of like a contract um, employee. So we'll give you kind of that, that a, a full amount of a stipend in order to pay that, that fellow. So those um, time frames are a little more open and flexible for spring, summer of next year. So um, we do have a few deadlines to apply, one being the end of this month. If you'd like to have a spring fellow next, uh, next year or in September or November. So the dates are, um, we do have deadlines, but we really want this to be open to as many folks as possible. So I'd really just encourage you to check out our website and read more. There's a ton of more details I've included on there. And I'm always open to answer more questions if you have any of them. So please reach out. We hope that this helps elevate um, your ability to get some great work done. Thanks, Amanda. Sorry for spinning the slides ahead. My mouse got away from me. Um, okay, so the last uh, piece about our grant um, has both some specific things and some more general things, which is, again, why we're looking, continuing to look for more feedback. Um, we're looking to develop some new trainings and resources or make new trainings and resources available to folks. 
Um, so we'll be looking to develop some more consumer or general publications on local food systems and the benefits to, to local communities by doing food systems work, um, as well as just looking to kind of figure out what are additional trainings and resources uh, needed uh, that we could either figure out how to offer or develop or things like that. So some general things and then some more specific things. Um, we're working with um, Dr. Cheryl Boyer and the Center for Rural Enterprise Engagement to offer scholarships to their Insight Summit. Um, and that's actually like something to jump on right now um, because the scholarship application is open right now um, and the, the registration for the Insight Summit is open um, right now as well. So this is, and Cheryl can maybe speak uh, to it a little better than I can, but it is essentially um, new media marketing training for agriculture businesses, um, rural businesses, and it covers a range of topics from online merchandising, cybersecurity, social media, you know, how to develop a marketing plan using online platforms and things like that. Um, so the Insight Summit is, I believe it's offered over about six or, or eight weeks, and it's a hybrid asynchronous, uh, meaning you can do it whenever your time, uh, the time works for you. Um, course with a couple of live more conference type components. So this is a $200 value and we have 24 scholarships available each year of the grant. So if you want the opportunity to learn more and really boost your uh, knowledge of online marketing um, and online platforms and all of those topics, um, and you do something related to food uh, and the local food system, um, go ahead and sign up for one of those scholarships. We'd love to be able to offer you a scholarship for that uh, opportunity. Um, and if it doesn't work this year, you'll have two more opportunities um, in the future as well. So we'll be doing some farm to school trainings, beginning farmer trainings. Um, we're planning to bring back the regional in-person uh, farmers market workshops around the state that we used to do uh, before COVID. So excited to be able to uh, bring those, that information and resources out in person again. Um, and then we are looking forward to hosting a statewide local food excuse me, a statewide local food system summit in 2024 and 2025. So details are pretty thin on the ground regarding the summit at this point, um, but that is something to look forward to uh, in the latter half of next year as well. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions um, or I can pass it off to the next person. Thank you, Rebecca. If anyone has any uh, questions for Rebecca or Amanda, please feel free to throw them in the chat um, as we keep moving on our agenda. <clears throat> That's good. So let's see. I am our next speaker, and I failed to introduce myself at the beginning of this meeting when Secretary Beam um, passed it over. Spinning, so I'm making sure it's going to work. Hmm. Sorry about go. that. My Zoom kicked me off really quick. Let me try again. And if not, I can probably go off of memory. All right, here we go. So tonight I am going to talk to you about the Resilient Food Systems Infrastructure. My name is Brittany Grother and I am a grants coordinator at the Kansas Department of Agriculture. So um, an overview of the Resilient Food Systems Infrastructure Program, you'll often hear the acronym RFSI and that's what this program is. The Kansas Department of Agriculture was awarded $6.46 million to build resilience in the middle of our food supply chain to strengthen local and regional food systems. So our job with this cooperative agreement awarded by the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service is to work in partnership with the USDA to sub-award 
competitive grants to Kansas food and farm businesses and other eligible entities. So eligible food products under this grant are crops and products meant for human consumption, excluding meat and poultry products. So our fruits and vegetables and honey and a lot of our specialty crops for human consumption are all eligible product types under this program. Um, and individual applicants can apply for either infrastructure grants or equipment only grants. So infrastructure grants are going to be your larger projects. So those range from $100,000 to $3 million and require a one-to-one -one match. So for example, if you wanted to do the minimum award amount from the USDA, you would be putting in $100,000 and the USDA would be awarding $100,000 as the project minimum. There are reduced match um, opportunities for socially disadvantaged groups, women, minorities, veteran-owned businesses for those larger projects. And the equipment-only grants are going to be for your um, smaller projects. So those are going to range from $10,000 to $100,000. And those are for equipment-only purchases. You can't pay for personnel time or travel or anything like that. It's for the exact cost of the equipment. And those are going to be a simplified application. <clears throat> So this next slide shows some examples of potential infrastructure grant projects. So these are going to be those bigger grants, the $100,000 or more. Um, so purchasing and installation of specialized equipment that includes processing components, sorting equipment, packaging and labeling equipment, or delivery vehicles. I know delivery vehicles is something that's often needed, especially vehicles that are refrigerated. Um, increased storage space, that includes cold storage, expanding processing capabilities, modernizing equipment or facilities, and also construction of, a new, of new facilities. And these are just a few of the project types for those infrastructure grants. Um, the Kansas Department of Agriculture submitted our state plan to the USDA today, um, this afternoon that outlined our priorities for funding and how we're going to run our competitive uh, competitive grant process. Our three main priorities for the state, um, based off of feedback we received from uh, many producers across the state and stakeholder organizations are um, storage, including cold storage, aggregation points, and food processing infrastructure. So those are the three um, priorities we're going to put the most preference towards funding projects with. Um, but there are other types of projects that are can also be very competitive in the process. Um, please look for the application to be launched um, in October, late October or early November. We will have a three month application window for you to um, develop your plans and submit your application materials. Those applications will go through a competitive um, review process with an external review panel. We will elevate those up to the USDA for approval. And then we hope to be awarding projects by next summer. Um, those project terms will have two to three years to execute your projects um, as well. So there is an interest form on the Kansas Department of Agriculture's website. Um, it's I can throw that in the chat. It is agriculture.ks.gov slash RFSI. So if you go there, you can fill out an interest form and we will collect your contact information. And when that application goes live, you'll be some of the first people to receive notice. Um, we'll also do a press release when that goes live and we'll do a lot of um, outreach presentations as well about the program as we get started. Um, so with that, we are going to move into the last section of our agenda which is industry priorities and needs. Um, and we have three poll questions that Sammy Gleason is going to lead, who is also a member of the Kansas Department of Agriculture team. Thank you. Can we, oh, okay. What challenges have you experienced in the past year as specialty crop producers? Poor weather conditions, labor shortages, increased cost of production, lack of education and support, lack of infrastructure, decreased sales, market access, or please type other in the chat. And you can select more than one. If you've experienced yes. more than one challenge, you can select as many as you would like. 
Um, while you guys are filling that out, Amanda asked a question in the chat. Um, she's curious who is planning to support producers in applying for this grant. Um, do we have capacity to help producers apply or is that a need that we still need to fill? Um, so Ryan responded that the Kansas Rural Center is going to help support producers. The Kansas Department of Agriculture is also willing to help you with your application questions. We also have formal partnerships under the RFSI grant with K-State Research and Extension and the Heartland Regional Food Business Center out of the University of Nebraska um, to provide support to producers. So with that, I'm gonna close the first poll and share. Looks like weather, poor weather conditions is at 70% at the highest. And then increased cost of production. No surprise to both of those. Okay, and the next one we'll move on. Which of the following outcomes would make the greatest impact of the industry in the next year? Select your top three. Increase funding opportunities for business development, increase education, programming, promotion, and outreach, help growers aggregate products to support market development, increase specialty crop research, increase the number of specialty crops in Kansas, build industry support for KSCGA, complete a survey of the specialty crop industry, and identify workforce needs of specialty crop industry. And then if there isn't one, just type in the chat, please, other. And the purpose of these poll questions here at the end of the meeting is to help the Department of Agriculture understand the needs of the specialty crop industry so that we can help um, put focus on certain areas and do the most that we can to help move the industry forward. So we still have some participation coming in. Um, I will add on the Resilient Food Systems Infrastructure Grant Program that you can always contact the Kansas Department of Agriculture, give us a call, an email, and we can help answer questions with what we know so far about the application process. Um, we will have more information coming out as we get closer. Okay. Um, increasing increased funding opportunities for business development as at number one with 67%. And then with 51% um, help growers aggregate products to support market development. That one kind of got cut off. Next poll question. The purpose of the specialty crop block grant program is to enhance the competitiveness of specialty crops in Kansas. KDA should fund projects that focus on what issues. So please select the top two so we can help focus on these issues. Enhancing food safety, um, improving the capacity um, especially crop research, developing new and improved seed varieties, um, pests and disease control, increasing um, nutrients and knowledge and consumption of specialty crops, um, improving, improving efficiency and reducing costs, sustainability, or if you have others, please put in the chat. So the specialty crop block grant is a grant that the Kansas Department of Agriculture receives from the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service on an annual basis. We usually receive a little bit around $325,000 every year to fund projects with these goals in mind of addressing these issues. So every year we turn in what our state's funding priorities are. So this question is helping us figure out what you as an industry would like to see those projects focused on. And I know there's lots of people I saw on the participation list who are past specialty crop block grant recipients. So um, all of those past projects are on the Kansas Department of Agriculture website, their um, project description, so you can see what's been done in the past. And we hope to be able to announce our fiscal year 23 grant recipients in the next week or two. USDA is just finding, I think, some paperwork right now. Unfortunately, we didn't have it in time to announce tonight. That would have been exciting. <laughs> yeah, that would have been. <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. I think we're ready to share. Um, so it looks like at 51% improving efficiency and reducing cost was number one. And I think number two was sustainability. 
Thank you. Great. So we still have a few more minutes before we hit our 8.30 closing time. So I just want to open it up to questions if you want to raise your hand and unmute or if you want to throw them in the chat. I know the chat is extremely active during this meeting. So we'll go back and review the chat log and follow up as needed as well um, post meeting. I think we might have lost Brittany. <laughs> nope, I'm still here. Do you still oh, hear me? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you cut out. I'm not sure if that just happened with me. No, that's okay. Um, feel free to ask questions in the chat, unmute, or raise your hand. Um, Scott asked, will the PowerPoint presentations be available for viewing after the meeting? We have been recording this meeting, so we'll try to get the recording posted online. Um, and I will get with Rebecca and see if we can get a copy of her presentation. And we have Russell's um, workforce program presentation. And Robert asked a question that I think is a crowdsourcing type question. So he wants to know how other specialty crop producers are handling deer pressure. So if you want to respond to him in the chat, that would be great. I don't know if that's something that you deal with. So you have everything, all of our resources we're going to try to post on the Kansas Department of Agriculture website where you registered. Um, we will go ahead and put um, our support materials there. And there's um, one other thing I want to remind everyone of. If you're a certified organic producer, the Kansas Department of Agriculture offers an organic certification cost share application. This year, that amount raised to 75% up to $750 for reimbursement per scope. So if you're an organic producer, um, make sure to check that out. Um, offered by the Kansas Department of Agriculture, we still have around $18,000 worth of reimbursements that we can do. So we wanna get that money out the door to as many organic producers as we can. And I just submitted that in the chat. Thanks, Sammy. Alrighty, I saw some other reminders in there from some of our K-State folks. Um, Londa has shared some resources about their GAP training, their food safety training, and also free microbial, microbial water testing available to produce growers. And some deer resources as Good. well. Well, if we don't have any other questions, we will go ahead and close. I want to thank you all for participating tonight. I know we took time, valuable time out of your evenings when you could have been out in the fields. Well, hopefully you got a break from the fields and the air conditioning for a while. Um, thank you for engaging with our poll questions and with our presenters. And we look forward to working with you on some of these exciting programs that are coming out to move the industry forward in the next year. Um, as always, feel free to reach out to us at the Kansas Department of Agriculture. We're always here to help grow the agriculture industry in the state of Kansas. So with that, thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you, Brittany and Sammy. Well done. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Always appreciate it. Thank you.